The working class mobilizes around the world to commemorate International Labor Day. In Cuba, convened by the Central Workers' Union, various social sectors held a national parade to ratify their support for the revolution and condemn the strengthening of the blockade imposed by the United States. The Alba movements advocated regional unity and called for strategies against the capitalist hegemony that seeks to dominate Latin America. The United Nations called on the international community to provide resources to address the humanitarian crisis in Yemen. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Teresa Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news, and we do so in Cuba. Workers of the world began to mobilize this May 1st. The world commemorates the importance of labor rights and the struggle led by the socialist organization called the Second International in 1889. With the presence of General Raul Castro Ruz, historical leader of the revolution, and the president of Cuba, Miguel Diaz Canel, the historic parade to celebrate International Workers' Day began in Havana's Plaza de la Revolución. Thousands of Cubans began to march in the main Cuban cities to commemorate the workers, especially in the health sectors, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. From the early hours of this Sunday, workers' unions around the world demand greater employment opportunities and decent working conditions. Human rights organizations also demand fair labor contracts for women and combat child labor. Various social sectors march across the country to commemorate International Workers' Day, organized by the Central Workers' Union of Cuba. The mobilization that took place in different squares and avenues of the nation was held under the slogan, Cuba Lives and Works. The Central Act took place in Havana's Revolution Square and was attended by President Miguel Diaz Canel and revolutionary leader Raul Castro during the massive event, scientists and health workers together with other social sectors called for progress in the consolidation of the country's socialist and democratic model, expressed their support for the Cuban Revolution and condemned the growing blockade imposed on the country by the United States. The international context in which we develop the proletariat celebration is complex and challenging. Hostility is growing and the economic, commercial, and financial blockade imposed to us by the government of the United States is intensifying to the extent that is the main obstacle to our development program. Together with a pandemic that maintains negative impacts in the economic, social and labor fields, with the loss of millions of lives, the precariousness or total closure of jobs and the answers of social benefits, all this influencing the shortage of goods the retail trade and the increase of inflation. On this May 1st, demonstrations were held in several French cities to commemorate International Labor Day. Hundreds of people went out to march in cities throughout France, following the call of numerous labor associations and social movements. In Paris, labor activists voiced their rejection of the re-election of President Emmanuel Macron. They also decreed the raising inflation in the country and the deterioration of people's quality of life. According to a preliminary report issued by the National Institute of Statistics and Economic Studies, inflation stood at 4.8% by late April. Other French cities that saw major Labor Day demonstrations today were Marseille and Rennes. Italian trade unions were also on the street this May 1st to celebrate International Workers' Day. The guilds were asking for labor improvements. Trade unionists claims that since 2018, there are 20 million people on fixed term or precarious labor contracts and only 4 million people on indefinite contracts. Italian Labor Union Secretary Pier Paolo Bombardieri said demonstrations were aimed at pushing for the approval of a reform to end casual employment contracts. And in Haiti, at least three policemen were injured in clashes between the Chen Mechan and 400 Mawazo gangs engaged in an armed conflict in a region known as Plain Cul de Sac in their dispute for the territory. Police spokesman Gary Desorecier reported that the incident took place in the Croix de Bouquet community, a suburb located northwest of the capital, Port au Prince, just as authorities were conducting a search operation to localize, to localize gangs. According to a civil protection report, at least 20 deaths among civilians and gang members, as well as dozens injured, thousands displaced, and some 20 houses burned down, is the preliminary result of clashes among criminal gangs.
Ecuadorian President Guillermo Lasso announced Friday night that he established a state of exception in the free coastal provinces, which will be enforced during the next 60 days. Lasso said they deploy a total of 9,000 troops, of which 4,000 are from the police and 5,000 from the armed forces, to re-establish peace and order. He said criminal gangs such as Los Chorneros and Tiguerones are allegedly responsible for prison massacres, which last year alone caused the lives of over 300 inmates in several prisons across the country. In recent days, there have been bomb threats to judicial buildings, and a car bomb exploded outside a jail adjacent to the La Roca Maximum Security Prison in the province of Guayas, where the leaders of the prison massacres are being held. The crime rates have increased in these provinces, and according to the information that the police have, these are the places where a stronger collaboration is needed between the army and the police. This affects us all. It is terrible. We are all affected by insecurity. We can no longer go to places as easily as we used to. For example, if you go to a restaurant, you can't go there anymore. Now you buy takeaway food because you can, because of the lack of security. In Mexico, Esteban Cruz Rosas, journalist and indigenous leader, was released after being kidnapped on Thursday 28th in the municipality of Tangancicuaro in Machoquian. According to the state attorney's general's office, Cruz Rosas was released on Saturday after an operation by the National Guard and Mexican Army, who were in charge of tracking the victim through the mountainous areas of the Purepecha Highlands. He is currently being treated according to the legal protocols while the police investigation continues. Cruz Rosas, who is coordinator of the Communal Government Council in the indigenous Purepecha community of Ocumishum, where he works as a journalist, was kidnapped on Thursday, April 28th, around 2.30 p.m. local time, on the highway between Tangancicuaro and Charapan. Also in Mexico, mothers belonging to the community of relatives of deceased and missing migrants of El Salvador traveled through several cities in search of their missing relatives. This Friday, the caravan left from the Plaza Divino Salvador del Mundo en route to Guatemala and then to Mexico where they hoped to visit at least six migrant shelters to obtain some information about the fate of missing migrants on Mexican soil who were on their way to the United States. The group will enter the Mexican territory next Sunday. They will pass through Chiapas and Tabasco, then they will arrive to the shelter Las Patronas and on May 6 to the port of Veracruz. This caravan is organized every year by the Mesoamerican Migrant Movement Civil Association and the Bridges of Hope Project, but due to the pandemic, it had been postponed for two years. We are taking a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. In Argentina, the delegates of the third ALBA movement's Continental Assembly called for strategies against capitalist hegemony that intends to dominate Latin America. During the event, which started on Wednesday in Ezeiza, the member of the Secretariat of the meeting, Manuel Bartoloni, said the movements intend to develop strategies to face the deepening of the capitalist crisis. Also, the member of the Argentine Pharmacy Union, Pascual Manganiello, denounced the hegemony exercised by the United States, as well as the implementation of blockades to countries such as Venezuela and Cuba. Likewise, the president of the Simón Bolívar Institute for Peace and Solidarity Among Peoples, Carlos Ron, pointed out the work in the search for strategies to guarantee social justice, cooperation and solidarity to face the wrongs of the capitalist system. On Friday, April 27th, Guatemala was voted as chair of the Council of Ministers of the Association of Caribbean States for the next period, 2022-2023. On behalf of his country's government, Guatemalan Foreign Affairs Minister Mario Bucaro thanked the member nations of the organization for their favorable votes. In his speech, he highlighted the work carried out by Mexico, from whom he received the presidency. Guatemala's top diplomat said his country, through the foreign ministry, will continue working to promote economic and social development and will focus on climate change and migration, among other issues. The Association of Caribbean States is a regional organization with 25 member countries plus associates. Since 1994, the 
he had sought the uh, integration of the countries of the Caribbean basin to create a common economic space, preserve the sea, and promote sustainable development, investment, and cooperation. During the 27th Ordinary Meeting of the Council of Ministers of the Association of Caribbean States, Nicaragua was elected to chair the Organization's Special Committee on Sustainable Tourism for the period 2022-2023, together with Jamaica, the Dominican Republic and Guyana. These countries will occupy the first and second vice presidencies and the rapporteurship, respectively. During the meeting, Nicaragua submitted the annual management reports of the pro-temporary presidency of Mexico. In his speech, he stressed the importance of resuming China's request to join the Association of Caribbean States as an observer state, pointing out that China is the second largest trading partner of Latin America and the Caribbean. In Ukraine, the Russian government has sent about 60 tons of humanitarian aid to the city of Izum. According to a statement by the Russian Defense Ministry, the humanitarian aid was delivered in convoys escorted by the Russian Army Police. The cargo contains food, basic necessities, and materials to rebuild the civilian infrastructure damaged by the Ukrainian attacks. In this regard, the Defense Ministry said that works has begun in the city to rebuild roads that have been damaged during the conflict. A correspondent of the Russian magazine Sputnik reports that about 25 people, including six children, have been evacuated from the area of the Azov steel plant in the city of Mariupol. That's first the Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shogul and said Russian and Donetsk troops had freed Mariupol, but th there are still some members of nationalist militias blockaded at the Azov steel plant. According to the Russian Defense Ministry, since the start of the special military operation, military attacks have not been aimed at civilian facilities but at disabling Ukrainian war infrastructure. Pope Francis once more called for the opening of humanitarian corridors in the Ukrainian city of Mariupol to evacuate civilians from the conflict zone. This Sunday during Mass in St. Peter's Square and after reflecting on the Gospel, the Pope made an appeal to attend to the humanitarian situation in Ukraine. Also, Pope Francis recalled that the elderly and children are suffering in the midst of the conflict between Moscow and Kiev, being expelled from their territories. He also thanked the reporters for their work in bringing information about the armed conflict. Regarding the Afzostal steel plant, the Pope called for the evacuation of the people trapped in the city. Even now, even from here, I repeat my call for safe humanitarian corridors to be set up for the people trapped in the steelworks in that city of Mariupol. The Kremlin said Russia's special operation in Ukraine contributes to the world's liberation from the neo-colonial joke of the West. During a press conference, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov pointed out that the United States and the European Union attempt to hinder, by any means, those nations that carry out an independent domestic and foreign policy. Lavrov also urged Washington and NATO to stop delivering arms to the Kiev government, stressing that Ukraine does not need missiles but humanitarian solutions. The foreign minister also denounced that Ukrainian troops are using civilians as human shields and called on the United States and its allies to stop covering up the crimes of Ukrainian troops. Otherwise, they will have to answer for their complicity before the law. And we have more news coming up after a final short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. The United Nations call on the international community to provide resources to address the humanitarian crisis in Yemen. President and Humanitarian Coordinator for Yemen, David Gressley, said more than 23 million people, meaning almost three quarters of Yemen's population, are in need of assistance and call on the members of the international organization to address the situation urgently. 
Grassley also called on the countries of the world that pledged at an international summit in April to make donations to raise money to help Yemen deal with the humanitarian crisis to fulfill their commitments. The Palestinian Foreign Ministry has accused the international community of being an Israeli accomplice for its silence in the face of the growing number of crimes committed in the occupied territories. The Palestinian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, through a communique, said justice is not being served after the Israeli army's actions in Ramallah and urged United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres to activate the international protection system for Palestinian citizens. The Foreign Ministry also denounced the death of a Palestinian, Yahya Ali Adwan, during raids by Israeli soldiers in the village of Asun, it stated that these actions reflect the brutality and racism displayed by Israel in cracking down innocent civilians. The Emergency Operations Center of the Dominican Republic reported on Saturday that other eight provinces have been added to rainfall alert. According to the Operations Center, the provinces that are on alert for rain and classified in yellow are El Ceibo, Monte Plata, Hato Mayor, and San Pedro de Macorís. Those classified in green are La Romana, La Alta Gracia, El Gran Santo Domingo, San Cristóbal, Samana, Sánchez Ramírez, and Maria Trinidad Sánchez. The Operations Center warned that in the next few hours there could be heavy rains with thunderstorms and winds burst as a result of the storm surge over Puerto Rico. Two people died and several had to be rescued on Saturday after heavy rainfall led to massive flooding in Guadalupe. The Caribbean island is under a red alert for heavy rains and thunderstorms. Rainfall has exceeded 300 millimeters, a phenomenon higher than that recorded during Cyclone Maria. The access of the Ponta area are flooded and landslides are reported in the Grand Fonds. The rains have also resulted in power outage and difficulties in water distribution. Looking at the situation, the public has been requested not to move in the Point Tree area and not to hike in the mountainous area. Travel must remain limited to the rest of Guadalupe. Aid workers cannot reach out to displaced people in flood-hit areas in Uganda, as some roads and bridges have been washed off in the eastern and northeastern parts of the country due to flash floods following heavy rains, with hectares of farmland and homesteads destroyed. Homes and farmland have been submerged in more than three sub-counties, leaving scores of people homeless, according to the Uganda Red Cross. Local government has relocated people to safer ground previously, but some remain high up in the mountains because of the fertile soil. Families are in urgent need of assistance, according to the organization. Currently, people are camped in schools and churches as disaster response teams assess the extent of damage and needs. The meteorological department warns that ongoing heavy rains will continue till the end of May. There are families that have been evacuated from areas of Bulambuli, Bunambutie, and even in the resettlement area where, you know, uh, I think around two years ago, the government relocated some people from Bududa. They are On Saturday, May 30th, Cuban diplomat and politician Ricardo Alacron passed away close to his 85th birthday. The news was announced by his relative to local media on Saturday morning. However, they have not yet revealed the causes of his death. The renowned diplomat, who also worked as a writer and a politician, was born in Havana in 1937. He was involved in the revolutionary struggle from an early age, being elected in 1959 as president of the Federation of University Students. He also held other political positions, such as foreign minister, until 1993, when he was elected president of the National Assembly of the People's Power. Alarcón is remembered in Cuba for having broken negotiations with the United States, specifically in the migratory agreements between the two countries. And we have come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesoreenglish.net. You can also join us on our social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.